a deep seeker and transformative thinker, activist in our times, who has written and worked on many aspects of human life, education, philosophy, literature, and integral human development and social transformation. Uh, Chittabhai uh, was born on uh, October 3rd, 1923 in uh, Bagalpur in undivided district of Katak in Odisha, India, and left his mortal body on January 16, uh, 2011. Uh, Chittabhai, uh, you know, uh, he is known for his uh, ability and uh, uh, and uh, cultural uh, transformation. And uh, he had initiated uh, many creative experiments, including uh, he founded uh, Jeevan Vidyalay School of for Life in Cham Pitamunda district uh, in 1950. And his final uh, in integral education movement in Odisha and translated uh, many works of Sri Arvindo and mother to Uriya. Uh, he has written more than 50 books and majority of them be in Uriya and some of these in English. Uh, today, uh, we have Professor uh, Philip Patel. Uh, he's a great grandson of Charles Darwin and uh, he has a very deep and uh, a very uh, unique kind of uh, understanding about uh, tribal issues. Uh, we know him uh, uh, because of uh, Niamgiri movement, uh, success of uh, tribal, one of the very successful tribal movement. And he has a both, you know, a kind of activist and expert uh, knowledge uh, towards tribal issues. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and today uh, he will be talking about uh, uh, cultural issues and, uh, and he has been in many uh, tribal movement in India and uh, uh, for Chitta Bhai, you know, uh, he is a kind of uh, reference personality for uh, uh, Lik Patel because Chitta Bhai, uh, you know, is among the world's greatest uh, educationist uh, who have offered alternative models of learning that are par particularly suited for uh, uh, voiceless voice, marginalized section of society, for uh, whom top-down models give a rigid, inherently uh, unequal uh, simulacrum um, uh, of education, uh, and. Uh, what is, uh, you know, uh, India's uh, policy towards tribal education is very, very contested. And today we are going to understand the connotation of that initiatives, uh, bad consequence or good consequence. Uh, for that matter, we will critically scrutinize. Uh, so for uh, giving a kind of uh, brief introduction, I think uh, I request Ananta Bhai uh, to share uh, his brief introduction, and then we'll invite Thank you so much, Ranveer, and thank you, dear Felix. So today is uh, Makara Sankranti, and Sankranti as a festival is so, you know, so dear with our brothers and sisters in our Adivasi villages. And Sankranti is something which bridges the Adivasi village and the peasant villages. And I remember my first meeting with Felix in the summer of 1985, when he was on his way to Odisha. And he was asking me about Gopinath Paraja's uh, novel, uh, Paraja. And uh, Chittabhai, for example, as he appreciated uh, Gopinath Mahanti's Paraja, but he would always used to ask questions, you know. He would say, yes, but what Gopinath Mahanti then did after that, you know, he was a development officer and 
the identification that is shown in paraja is at an elementary stage but it could not be taken further so this is the kind of critic that chitabhai embodies a sense of critic to something that is meaningful but that still needs to be taken forward now chitabhai uh, in his uh, school in um, champati munda so there were some children from adivasi communities and that itself was as it is located in anugul in a kind of a near a tribal hamlet so that sense of nature work and gandhi so in a way felix uh, reflection on the possible mode of integral tribal education could possibly draw on this element experiment which draws on gandhi tagore gandhi five yes gandhi tagore and also grundtvig from uh, denmark who practiced this initiative of folk education so possibly uh, felix uh, very deep quest about possible modes of um, adivasi integral education builds on these experiments and felix also in his abstract talks about the way uh, models of uh, indigenous language is being used in new zealand and other south american countries including in norway for example both sweden and norway which really suffered from you know the unspoken logic of majoritarianism when i was visiting tromso they were trying to find a place for sami language in the university so university students could write their thesis in the sami language for example now the language issues is very important and with all limitations government of odisha started an initiative in education in the tribal languages and uh, felix would certainly know dr mahendra mishra uh, was uh, a participant in that and he has uh, dr mahendra kumar mishra just has come out with a very interesting book called arai arai just half uh, you know two weeks ago it has come out so these initiatives are there at the same time there is the persistent problem of cultural otherness of course felix uses the word racism and that itself is uh, is a deep challenge to us and whether it is every cultural otherness is racism or not and beyond the academic question it is not just a question of academic semantics uh, and it also challenges our notion of practice you know because we see that uh, in uh, in uh, european societies after the end of so called racism there is a very pervasive problem of racism without race and what we are witnessing today in gaza and the genocide of gaza i'm just coming from a discussion from gaza kind of the genocide of gaza and the annihilation of the indigenous population and many annihilation that uh, our adivasis are going through in india they are connected but at the same time yeah, is every form of cultural uh, uh, otherness is a kind of racism which requires critical scrutiny one final line about chitabhai's reflection on the adivasis is that chitabhai worked closely with groups like agrogami you know which worked with the adivasi population and their main theme was dignity we do not we cannot give anything to the adivasi the only thing we can bring is our dig- dignity of coexistence and co recognition another thing chitabhai used to stress that as uh, specific are the challenges of marginalized communities whether dalits or adivasi we must emphasize on their fact that all of them are citizens of india and as i reflect critically upon chintavai's reflection maybe he was a bit more sanguine about prospect of constitutional citizenship but the kind of annihilation of both language and life that the adivasis are going through which chintavai also was a witness to it requires along with constitutional citizenship realization it also requires specific kind of realization and finally chitabhai was in his own way 
was part of the indigenous struggle for freedom and liberation he was very drawn to the work of rigoberta menchu in um, in south america in guatemala and the struggles in africa so and uh, felix in his own way he embodies that kind of a global indigenous awakening a global indigenous awakening which requires some integral adivasi education and many dimensions of that integral education would also involve an education with our indigenous life worlds and uh, for example language and the ways of life and therefore that integral adivasi education is not isolated from what i met a very interesting group near um, the zapatistas in mexico in 2005 in san cristobal la casas when i was visiting a father he was initiating a uh, initiative called university of the art university de tiara so integral adivasi education possibly as part of the university of the art so thank you felix for joining us and thank you randi and friends and we look forward to being held our hands by felix and move forward with chitavai felix and our adivasi brothers and sisters in this day of sankranti which is also the birthday of fakir mohan sanapati another great fighter fighter for dignity of language and existence felix please thank you so much ananta what a great introduction and very rich in different ideas and relevant context so i will um aim to speak for about 40 minutes and then as you say i hope a lot of good discussion and questions will come um i want to begin uh by acknowledging two people that my work owes an enormous amount to one is my main teacher who i think was also ananta's teacher was jps oboroi who died a few days ago in delhi and he had a very moving memorial at the india international center yesterday which was live streamed and um jps oboroi was a tremendous thinker original thinker of indian sociology of um questioning especially the western hegemony of ideas in understanding what we think of as science or culture um i won't say more about him than that except that my thinking i i you know i am one of his students so um he's a very neglected thinker in india but uh, um i've already published in one of ananta's books uh, a tribute to him The other person is Madhuka Gupta, a young researcher who I've worked very closely with on this issue of tribal education. Also, along with Sharanya and Raja Raman Sundaresan, who are both in Orissa now, and I, I can see Sharanya is part of this group. So, very good to see you here, Sharanya. Madhuka is very busy, but um, she was a, a student of one of India's other great thinkers, which is Krishna Kumar, especially on education. um he was head of the ncert the, the that oversees education in india but also a uh, professor of education studies in delhi university and a tremendous well gandian as well as thinker of really as jps roy was of how to what is proper education really questioning that and looking very very realistically at how to implement it as, in the best way in the country um so a lot of what i say will be thanks to my book so because um we went to many of the tribal schools in different states in india together and really those visits have uh, informed a lot of what i will be saying uh but one of the things i will be emphasizing is how even if you look at agrigami that is doing tremendous work in this field and uh, for, uh, other examples throughout the country a lot of the best tribal schooling in india is being done by non tribals or overseen by non tribals in madhuka's research therefore led her to ecuador which is one of the latin american countries where the indigenous people have most control over their own education so they've 
teaching in their own language, bringing in their own culture, and having control over their education. So it's not um, such a top-down system, you could say. But I, I'm uh, going ahead of the argument there, but I just wanted to mention um, that there is a lot of uh, amazing uh, initiatives within India and a lot of amazing initiatives with outside India. And for tribal education to reach its potential, there is a lot that needs to be learned from many of these different um, situations. So I'm going to start by looking at what, what are called alternative education systems. As both of you so far have mentioned, Chitaranjan Bhai was really exceptional in uh, looking at education, both in the early forest school he started in the 1950s, and then in bringing Aurobindo's integral education to Orissa. But apart from that, well, India is famous for the Krishnamurti schools, which I've had some interaction with, which uh, also <clears throat> give a very holistic model of, of education. And one could, of course, mention Tagore, also in Shantaniketan. His initiative is famous. And above all, Gandhi, because the Nai Talim that Gandhi initiated, Gandhi himself considered it his greatest legacy to the future. And it is quite sad that in India it's been almost forgotten. And the principles of this, of, of Gandhi's Nai Talim education, were maybe just to summarize very briefly, working with the hand, mind and heart together. So the hand is not considered inferior to the mind uh, and, and both are informed by the heart. Then he also emphasized local arts and crafts, that uh, the idea that even at school should be self-sufficient, that the children in their learning could create something that can be sold to, rather than um, dependence on any, any outside funding. Then he also really emphasized mother tongue education, which is one of the main things I'll talk about today. Um, so there, there's a model within India. From outside India, as you mentioned, a Danish model. Also, there's an amazing French model after the Second World War to uh, bring about education for peace, which I'd love to know more about those. Also, the Rudolf Steiner schools, which are all over Europe and present a, very, a similarly very holistic and spiritual-based model of learning. Rudolf Steiner was one of the really great and neglected thinkers of Europe. Um, and the Montessori schools, and one can many, mention many others. But another model um, is the Paolo Freire model of critical pedagogy. And this has been implemented by one school that I visited a lot in India, in Bhopal, called Muskan. It's more a kind of education system uh, where they it, it's focused around displaced tribal communities and communities of the denotified tribes, what used to be called the criminal tribes, bringing th these children's languages into the classroom so that the children themselves are teaching the teacher. So the teacher, again, it's not such a top-down system. And it's also very political that children are encouraged to think and talk about their political situation, to not be silent about many of the things that children are normally silent in school about. So that's a little bit of a, a background. Among other uh, examples that I should mention that I visited in India is Ganesh Devi's Tribal Academy in Gujarat that brings in the tribal languages in a very positive way. Um, Adarshila, another school in Madhya Pradesh that brings in the tribal language and the tribal cultivation of food as a big part of the curriculum. Uh, the Mitra School near Bismkatak in Orissa, where they really bring in the, the Kui, the Khond's language. Another one that I think has closed down is Imli Mohua in Chattiska in Dantewara district, um, where again they used the languages, they brought in tribal artisans to teach the children and again cultivating plants was a big part of the curriculum um, and a little bit like 
uh, Chitranjan Das's first forest school, the Imli Mohua, I, I think maybe has closed down now. And I think part of the reason was there's a tension between if you are really trying to give a uh, holistic education for children, then how do you meet the exam criteria? And I think Imli Mohua, like um, Chitranjan's forest school, it couldn't uh, meet those exam requirements or didn't want to. And um, in, in practice, of course, all the Adivasi children, they need those exam qualifications to because the livelihood is more and more dependent on jobs. So that is a, a tremendous tension. And maybe as a background also to remember that um, I think one of the best books ever written by an anthropologist about tribal people in India is Barry Elwin's book, The Murya and the Gotul. And that is about the education, the traditional education system of the the Gond in, in Buster. And what is so remarkable about that book and the system that it described because they, they even had a gotul in the Imli Mohua village in Dantiwada. It is a system that the Maoists banned it and then some people have tried to bring it back. Um, but of course that was in an age when there was no reading writing, where Adivasis were not considered illiterate. They didn't consider themselves inferior for not reading and writing. There was no pressure for literacy. So what was taught there was riddles, games, crafts, dancing, knowledge about the spirits, the ancestors, the tribes, um, and, and so much more. It was great fun, as well as often very hard work. They learnt the skills of building a house, of cultivating fields, of hunting. Um, and children were in charge of other children. They were actually, they, they lived partly away from parents. So the Gotul system, and if you think of another tribe, the Oraun, it, largely in uh, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, there is a very famous interaction that was published in a research article about tribal education about 30 years ago, where the researcher is saying, aren't you sending your children to school? And the, the Oraun man said, school education just alienates them from our culture. What they're learning there, Babu, it's your culture, it's not our culture. And we find the children, when they come back from school, then they're not motivated to work, they're not going to respect us as a community, our elders, our customs. They don't want to work with our hands and so on. So this um, encapsulates a very, very general condition of what has been happening. So to go a little bit, as Ananta was saying, into the, the policy, like, if you have India's first tribal policy as it was enunciated by Nehru in, in collaboration with Barry Elwin, who was his kind of Minister of Tribal Affairs, it was basically hands-off to, to allow tribal people to be in charge of the genius of their own culture development, not define development as something that's being imposed. Nehru was making that policy, but in practice he was doing the opposite because the industrialization that he started, the big dams, as people have said, the dams, Nehru called them the temples of modern India, but they were displacing tens of thousands of Adivatis already in the 1950s to 60s, as were the first steel plants, the first aluminium factories that were brought up in collaboration with the making of these dams. So you had mass displacement happen happening. And if you look at the policy documents, the first two big policy committee reports on tribal policy in India were the Elwin reports and the Debar, SC Debar reports in, that came out in the early 1960s. And they very strongly advocated for for example, the tribal languages, um, that there should be textbooks printed. But the, the committee report actually talks about how there had a lot of conflict with some of the new state governments. And I think Orissa is a classic example of that, where 
Orissa then wanted to all the schools to be Orissa-based. Um, so it didn't really want tribal languages in there. It did agree to it. And I remember another anthropologist called Juti uh, describing to me in Malaga how decade after decade, tribal language textbooks have been printed, but they have not been used because uh, a, a, a very small percentage of ST or Adivasi people were qualifying as teachers. So over 90% of the teachers were non-tribals. They had no incentive, no interest in learning the tribal languages. And this, I mean, part of the history too is if we go back to ashram schools, which as the history books tell us, Gandhi delegated uh, Thakur Bapa, the Maharashtrian engineer, Gandhian, to oversee tribal education. And he started the whole system of, tribe, of ashram schools. In fact, within Gujarat, there were several different traditions, some much more interested in bringing in the language. But in 1946, just before independence, in, uh, in, a, in a very big meeting, um, Jaipal Singh Munda confronted Thakur Bapa, saying, you say that you are bringing tribal languages into the schools, but how many tribal languages do you know? And Thakur admitted, I, I don't know any. And Jaipal said, well, it's good you admit that, because none of your teachers do either. And although you talk about introducing the tribal languages just in the first one or two years, in practice, you're not doing that at all. And if you look at, India now has at least 3,000 ashram schools, that because they spread rap rapidly in Thakur Bapa's model from Gujarat, from Western India to Orissa and other states. Um, in practice, not only is the tribal language not brought into the schooling, but tribal children in maybe 90% of tribal schools in India, they are punished if they speak those languages. And this came to me in another uh, tribal school I visited, I think run by the Ramakrishna Mission in South Chhattisgarh, where we saw a notice, Sanskrit classes every morning at 5 a.m. So it's great, you <laughs> Sanskrit classes. But this is a predominantly Gond area. So Gondi is one of the most ancient languages of India. It's like a grandfather to the Tamil language. And children are not encouraged. They're probably punished again for speaking that language. So in uh, the Muskan, talking and interviewing some of the young women who are school teachers in that system, uh, they are themselves Gond. So they, they taught their Gondi language to the other children, the other teachers in that system of Muskan, where they are encouraging two or three tribal languages along with Hindi, along with English. But they said when they were at school before that, a normal school, if they spoke the tribal language, they were beaten. Their brothers were beaten and they were all humiliated for speaking it. Um, and Ganesh Devi, again, who started the Tribal Academy in Gujarat, uh, he wrote the People's Linguistic Survey of India, or he oversaw that massive process. And if you understand the statistics of the decline of tribal languages, it's really absolutely devastating. I mean, these languages, because they're not taught at school, because the the languages have been banned at the school or, or not brought into the curriculum at all, um, the tribal youth, they are often ashamed to speak those languages and then they stop speaking them and you've got a, what many refer to as linguistic genocide. So, this talk, I'm going to speak largely, especially focusing on cultural racism, but my work from the 1990s has highlighted cultural genocide as the overall situation that Adivasis and tribal communities find themselves in India, in the sense that um, 
It's not like a, a planned violent genocide in the in the sense that you had in North America. We use the term genocide very one of where it's never contested is in the North American situation. So many tribes face genocide. Some were completely destroyed and many then were removed to um, reservations. And then in the system of forced assimilation that was the current policy, the, the policy in United States and Canada, the children were, were taken by force to residential schools and where they were not allowed to speak their language, not allowed to practice their religion. The first symbol was always the hair was cut short and they were really, the aim was to totally assimilate them and make them, to kill the Indian in them, as they said, to, to save the man. They saw it in this Christian way of saving the man by killing the Indian. It was a very... So this is what we call cultural genocide. What has been practiced in North America is cultural genocide that attempt not just, okay, you have, we're not going to kill all the people, but we're going to kill the culture. We're going to kill the languages. We're going to kill their religion. And this is... When India's policy was formed in... Uh, the tribal policy became articulated during the Nehru years. India was meant to steer a course between, on the one hand, isolation, and on the other hand, assimilation. But, um, and th this was called integration, that trying to be integrated into the mainstream, but also by bringing their own culture and teaching other people their language or culture or being proud of it or not losing it. But in the most recent uh, Virginia's Kaka committee report that came out in 2014, he talks in that report about covert assimilation as the dominant practice in India, that in practice, all these schools, if you have 5,000 residential tribal schools in India and many more other day schools and so on, um, the, the policy, especially if you interview, as we have done, some of the teachers, the policy is to assimilate them. That The teachers have such a negative idea about tribal culture that really it's, they, they, they're trying to, as it were, missionize them now, make them into um, good Indian citizens by erasing their what's seen as degraded culture and so on. This came to me when I was in Bissam Katek and living there and I had an Oriya teacher. He became headmaster at one point of an ashram school for the Khand children and I said, wow, Lalu, you're so lucky. You are um, in a position to learn so much from these children. And he said, I do not want to learn from them, Felix. And I, I, I've come to realize that is a very, very, um, that has been the predominant attitude, really. So, how this, it, it, from then cultural genocide, seeing, because I was first looking at that in terms of displacement, that mass displacement, maybe 25% at least of the ST population in India is now displaced by industrial and dam projects. So, when a community is displaced, they lose the culture, they lose the will to live for the old people, they lose dance, dance becomes meaningless, they, they, they can no longer support themselves, and this is the beginning of cultural genocide. But it was working with Malvika and others more recently that I've come to realise it, it's much more than that, that because then the role of schooling in that, that, for example, KISS in ERISA, the Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences, which um, some of you will know I've critiqued quite strongly in a series of articles with Madhika, um, because of the radical way that it's taking children away from their communities, a long way away, and segregating in them in all kinds of ways. Girls and boys cannot interact, which is a huge part of tribal culture. So KISS has, it started uh, as an organization, especially for displaced Adivasis. So this is quite significant. Another aspect of KISS is that 
some of the funding or the joint ventures come by working with the very mining companies the displacing tribal people. Now it's true that KISS gets, it's got quite a lot of funding from the UN for multilingual education. But Mahendra Mishra himself has told us how the way that it was set up in KISS is very tokenistic, meaning um, they have a language lab, they bring in some tribal songs and things, but as a language of discourse, as a language that all the teachers themselves are learning and learning to think in, no, KISS is not doing that. So the cultural racism, in, in a way, so I'm bringing these three concepts, cultural genocide as an overall um, description of what's happening for the Adivashtas in Christian society, happening with the languages. And cultural racism as the predominant attitude towards the Trump people. And I mean, I, I'm really grateful that Ananta mentioned what's happening in Gaza because as I and many, um, you know, all of us are watching in real time, witnessing, many are, 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 are calling, I think, justly a, a genocide. But part of it comes out of the racism that I would say Israel is maybe one of the most racist countries, just in terms of the um, the ways that Palestinians are described, even on state media. Um, it, it's truly shocking. People are, are beginning to wake up to this, that really it is like in that sense an apartheid, that you have one group of citizens really depriving another group of the Citizen, basic citizen rights because they are seen as like animals or much less evolved. So that is very much how the Adivasis are uh, um, perceived. And I wanted to bring in this, as, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a descendant of Darwin. And Darwin's ideas were applied to society, especially by Herbert Spencer, in the sense of what is called social Darwinism or social evolutionism. So this is, as this theory became popular, you can see the Marxist framework where societies first live in primitive communism, then they develop through slave owning societies to feudalism, then we have capitalism, and now we're in advanced capitalism. And if you're a socialist, you might hope that we then get to a kind of advanced socialism. But there's not much sign of that, I'm afraid, at the moment. But um, this, the World Bank has a much more stark division of countries and regions into underdeveloped, developing, and developed. And as somebody who really critiques this idea, I mean, this idea, it's so common sense. We meet it in so many ways to think that our society is the most developed. And we developed through these primitive stages that now we've gone past those stages. We've been affected by the missionaries into this way of thinking. But if you look at, well, if you look at India itself, India was, to call India a developing country and the UK where I am as a developed country, to me it is a complete misuse of language. It's it's a completely wrong way of, of viewing things that um, India is only a developing country in strict t economic terms as defined by the World Bank. But if you look at the history of it, India was a multicultural society. Like in the 18th century, when the East India Company took over, it was taking over a truly multicultural society in a way that Britain at that time was absolutely not. It was only Protestant Christians who were in charge. If you were a, a, a non-conformist, if you're a Roman Catholic, if you were Jewish, if you were Muslim or Hindu, you couldn't hold a, a government post. It, it was so um, dogmatically hegemonic in that sense. And in, in manufacturing skills too, the metalworking and clothworking, the quality achieved in India before the East India Company took over was much higher than anything achieved really before or since in Europe. So what I'm questioning is this model of seeing 
some versions of society as more developed and some as less developed. Because that, in, in a way, the whole Indian policy for tribal people, which is embodied then in the schools, is based on this idea, we are civilized, they are uncivilized. And again, if you look at Adivasi society, this is not to romanticize them because, um, you know, every society has its shadow side or has its faults or good and bad. And what is conceived good and bad is, it changes in different times, in different ages. But certainly you could say one difference between the traditional Adivasi society and the modern society is for us, a, a key value is competition, whether that's in politics, in economics, in law, in sports, in, in all the fields, um, we consider competition to be good. In Adivasi society, the, the core value I would say was sharing. So the economic system is, in as much as they had economic activity of trade, they would often work on each other's lands. It's not necessarily a monetarized exchange. And the whole thing is geared towards sharing, towards not making a profit at another person's expense. Similarly with the use of resources, it was what can really be called sustainable because they were not using, they, they had all kinds of taboos and prohibitions against using too much. And sharing in terms of the legal system, as many anthropologists described it, was the aim of the legal process is reconciliation. And if you think of real civilized behavior, our legal system, you could say basically the Roman system that has been applied in India and in Britain, it's based on competition where both parties may hire lawyers, often the one hiring the lawyers at the greater fee is going to win the case. And it's all in terms of winning, losing, like sports, winners and losers. The tribal sport is above all dancing. And in dancing, you don't have winners and losers. You have great skill and even some kind of competition, but above all, you have working together. You have a sharing. And uh, similarly with law, that reconciliation, what can be more civilized than really trying to bring the two contestants to have a feast of reconciliation together? So in many ways like that, when when Elwyn and Deba were looking at the at the tribal schooling systems and what was beginning to be set up in in India of more and more tribal schools and hostels, they were really trying to emphasise don't um, don't challenge the old tribal institutions. Try and learn alongside them. Bring in literacy, but um, you know respect the tribal languages. So. <clears throat> I, I can talk more about these aspects later, but how, how long have I been? I don't want to go over time, and I, I want to get to question time. Uh, no, you, you have five to eight minutes. You can. I'll just tie up then. Thank you, you so much. You have... Okay. Um, so maybe I will come now to the uh, some of the other models that uh, Ananta mentioned before is and, and I mentioned before, is if you look at some of the indigenous groups in other countries, New Zealand is very famous for the Maori. The Maori in New Zealand are speak the same language. So in every school in New Zealand, even white New Zealanders, they have to learn some Maori. And I was very moved when I went there and I met a, a white woman who, whose son went to school without many Maori there, but they had the Maori custom of each child had to compose something they meet, which is an, uh, to say who they are, to say what river and mountain they come from. And they had to do this in the Maori language. So all the white children in that school were learning enough Maori to learn that. And you think of that is quite impressive. They're learning the language, the, the culture together. I'm, I'm living in Wales and it, it's something not much known outside the UK, uh, but 
The Welsh language has made a, a tremendous revival. So every school in, in Wales teaches Welsh and probably two thirds of the school teach in Welsh. So as a, a, a British student, and I, I have a son, Akash, who's born in India, um, half Indian. And uh, for every every child in Wales have, has to learn some Welsh, has to um, that even subjects like the the sciences and mathematics are taught in in Welsh, so you it really is quite a bilingual culture here, and they've managed to revive the language against all the odds because a hundred years ago, any child who spoke Welsh at school was beaten and put in a corner with a, a very famous kind of reprimand they call the Welsh knot. So I, and in fact the Maori Maori has a television station in the Maori language. And they modeled that on the Welsh uh, television channel that we have here. But some other countries, for example, why Malvika went to Ecuador is because there they have a system called intercultural bilingual education, uh, which is again is overseen by committees largely from the indigenous communities. So I'm, I'm giving these examples that India has a long way to go in terms of really beginning to understand the importance of this. I've been to only one Aurobindo school in uh, in Orissa, I have to say, which was in Korapit district. And their tribal languages absolutely were not brought in. So I I personally don't know how much this is part of um, the feeling of uh, what Chitra Das did with and the Aurobindo education. But I can see there's quite a lot of Sanskrit there. and. You know, Sanskrit is great, but if some more Adivasi concepts are brought in, it would be really excellent. And of course, this is much more complex in India because um, just within Orissa, you have at least 20 or 30 main tribal languages. You know, I know a little bit of the Kui language, the Dorava language, but then in North, there's also Santali, there's Gondi, there's Buruk, the Oraon language, there's Munda, how many Bodo, many of the languages are there and are all facing this decline. So this would be one thing to really give some thought to. And as I say, if you look at Mahendra, Mahendra Mishra's work and th those who have tried to introduce multilingual education in Orissa and other parts, they've done amazing work, but the I think you could say the really what they're facing is this cultural prejudice, prejudice or cultural racism that really a majority of the people, I you know, I love the Oriya language. I've learned to become quite fluent in it. Um, but it's also hegemonic in KISS in other schools. So really, if you were bringing in Santali in the Santala area or Kui in the Konda area, as the Mitra school in Katik is doing, um, it, it, it's easy to talk about, but very, very difficult to do. It needs really a lot of collective awakening to the incredible heritage that's in these languages, because it is what we call ontological. It's a matter of each language contains a life view in, in the language, in the ways of thinking. As an English immigrant into Wales, I'm very aware that the language here in Wales speaks Welsh. It's there's so many more terms in Welsh for places, for features of nature. And the same when I was living in Bissamkat, I was aware Oriyas had a very superficial language for places and uh, different species of birds or anything. While the the local, the tribal language, it's much much richer. The landscape. In Odisha speaks Kui or it speaks these other languages. And of course, the Kons are probably the same as the Kalinga people. Kuinga is the Kon name for themselves. And I'm saying this just to be aware of this incredible cultural heritage that is being lost very far, fast as, you know, the competition is rising to get jobs. People are getting thrown off the land. Livelihoods are under massive threat as never before. Um, I think I'll end there, and there's much else to talk about, but I'd like to hear from people there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really, very enriching and inspiring. And, uh, you know, uh, 
we just not only uh, learn from the travel but a kind of alternative education model be it nay talim of ravin of atma gadi uh, initiative of ravindran tagore and for that matter chitrajan das the question which is very uh, you know important for us to how to maintain diversity how to maintain uh, cultural voice and how to give a space of alternative education and the kind of uh, problem or the challenge that tribal education face is very very important for us so it was a really very interesting presentation now i request the respected participant to share their concern or queries so we initiate the uh, 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 sharania ji uh, who has joined today's thank you. thank you so much uh sarnya ji is taking some time so we can invite uh, shivani uh, you are muted oh yeah i'm i'm uh, not switching on the video because no network here if i put on the video it will become very slow but um yeah thank you felix felix for like you know raising uh, things i think i just want to perhaps add that uh, what we understand or what our experiences have been of uh, adivasi children going into formal schools or ashram schools especially and then you know how their world views also change so like you were saying you no know, taking that a language also holds a world view so uh, when you lose that language and obviously you also then lose uh, you know the the world view that that language carries and so what happens what what uh, we have seen as you know like this multilingual education program in orissa it sees language only as a bridge so you know it continues to see oriya as a hegemonic language language of power language of the ruling class ruling caste and it uh, it does not empower the adivasi uh, language speaker to see her or his own language uh, you know in that uh, context of it being a world view of who they are who their community is what is their history um you know uh, what's what was their relationship with their land what was the relationship uh, you know what kind of knowledge systems that a language uh, carries in itself so it has reduced you know multilingual education programs cases uh, you know language lab has reduced uh, you know adivasi languages to just bridges like a bridge from you know not being able to speak odia to being able to speak uh, odia and so then it's not really a very empowering for me and uh, you know for many of us who've been seeing how adivasi children uh, you know kind of relate to their own communities their elders their ancestors once they get into the formal schools ashram schools and it's a complete uh um, no cultural descent this inheritance and that i think is also a very critical part of cultural racism that uh, you know flows from language not being taught um in um, in schools i think like then raja can add more thank you so much for complimenting what i was saying shrenya yeah and really spelling out what cultural racism is some of what it is no uh, i just wanted to add one thing felix it was really wonderful listening to you and also sharania adding those points and you have sort of language is central to the adivasi oh, world as you have in, and you have emphasized that throughout your uh, in the last 40 minutes but i just wanted to add this thing yeah. 
You're muted, Rajan. Yeah. So I was just saying that, uh, yeah, l placing language central to your 40, the last uh, 40 minutes of your talk is really important. And uh, racism needs to be looked because uh, barring Adivasi youth from speaking their languages is to barring their access to their worldview. That's the way uh, uh, it, uh, it could be looked also as. And also I was just interested to sort of say this also when we are using the word alternative uh, i think we uh, i think we need to be a little bit careful in this sense that uh, are we really talking about an alternative in this sense that alternative to the already existing uh, adivasi uh, adivasi education models like gotul that you said so uh, if we sort of alternative we say we are saying alternative to the hegemonic models that already exist but do adivasis really need an alternative because there already exists an educational system that has been in their uh, lives for generations so whose alternative are we proposing here is the question i think i somehow sort of feel that we should uh, alternative when we say we can say say again there is a brahminical uh, influence in India, particularly because India is a very deeply caste society too. So, an alternative that is being proposed can be an alternative to the current hegemonic model. But then, do really need are, are really Adivasis need an alternative? Uh, again, it will be another sense of uh, using the word of alternative that has been coming out from a non-indigenous person. Uh, again, imposing a model. Uh, coming out from a non-indigenous person and using a word called alternative when they already have Gotul, Dangra, Dangri Basa and many other already uh, Dumkuria, all of these models already exist. That was the short comment I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really. J just to compliment that, <coughs> one of the other terms that has often been made is um, like KISS and many other schools call the students first generation learners when their parents have been quote uneducated but of course you know what is education in many ways their parents may have been literate non-literate but they may of, often have been person of immense knowledge and education in terms of their own traditions so to call somebody a first generation learner is itself a, a very derogatory way to describe people and the process and it also kind of uh, assumes that they that the Adivasis were not learning till now. Exactly. You know, the previous generations never learned anything. Exactly. <laughs> it's only, <laughs> you know, the formal school becomes, uh, you know, the space where they start learning, the act of learning. Yeah, uh, I, I have a question. <clears throat> if you can you. Uh, help me out on this. Please. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, basically we are we are we are uh, going to start a startup company in Assam, which is more interested on doing an R and D on uh, the traditional Indian medicine. And we understand that the tribal people have immense knowledge on uh, uh, nature and its uh, nature-based medication system. And we try to reach out to people at uh, Odisha, mostly mostly called the Koraput and other part of remote part of Odisha, where we have come across uh, people who have got. Uh, immense knowledge on curing many of the life-threatening diseases. So, and, and uh, yeah, currently also we are expanding on a uh, few of them uh, based on the Ayurveda and its ancient principle of uh, medication. So, I am, of, I am, I am. My question is: Do this kind of forum has an has an uh, ability to understand or do a research or or kind of collaborate with us to make this and in a uh, create an impact on a bigger scale, maybe beyond India and all. Uh, just to briefly approach that subject, because that is, you're right, one of the areas where Adivasis, I think all tribal communities throughout the country tend to have immense knowledge about the healing properties of plants. And I could talk about that knowledge for hours, uh, but it's I, I couldn't teach it, you know, and in fact, you have to approach the community with immense respect and not trying to make a profit. I have the one 
uh, friend who I think Anantana is called Madhu Ramnat, who has specialized. I would say he has the greatest knowledge of Vadivasa generally of any person in the country. And especially he'd worked on the issue of plants and he'd worked a lot with the good people in the forest department to try to cultivate particular medicinal plants that are, are needed. Because one of the problems is if an Ayurvedic entrepreneur comes along and tries to get some of this knowledge and understand where the plants are and go and get them from the forest, then you become very exploitative, and both of the Adivasis and of the forest. And there, there are, in fact, many Ayurvedic plants that have become very rare because of this kind of ex exploitation. So I would just give that warning uh, with this that, you know, this is, it's such a complex and deep subject that um, if you look at healing within a tribal village, yes, they have an incredible knowledge of plants, but they also, they use shamanism. You know, they um, the shaman goes into trance and communicates with the ancestors. And I've heard things to do with that knowledge about plants that comes in trance sessions that would blow your mind you know there is incredible depth there but it's something you can't just in the western way separate what's material from the spiritual tradition and now you're talking about the spiritual tradition that is shamanic which is shamanism was banned by the west by christianity for 2000 years and it's really despised within india so you you cannot approach a shaman and expect to learn from him by paying him money. You know, uh, th this is a, a, a very, very deep um, and very complex no, tradition. I, I, I fully, I fully understand that. In fact, in fact, just to just to add, um, my great great uh, grandfather uh, who was a Boidio in his time. Though I am not from tribal uh, caste or creed, uh, but then uh, he had uh, he uh, so it's a traditional Ayurvedic knowledge. He had uh, come up with an uh, detoxification process and the juice that he had recommended in his manuscript which we had got incidentally a couple of months back and we started applying it on uh, on us and our family and all and currently more than 500 people and including cancer patient kidney patient bp sugar various lifestyle patient obesity patient and uh, are, 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 are getting amazing results and uh, i think three days back uh, banaras hindu university professor have started researching on this to find out the active ingredient available on this detox juice and uh, now we, we we are thought of uh, reaching out to more people through the um, uh, through social media and many other uh, other other kind of you know, network and uh, no there are iit bhubaneswar they are interested to do a research on this to separate the apis that is involved in this so there i come across one person from koraput uh, who has got this traditional uh, tribal knowledge is, that has come to him from generation of uh, his, his father, forefather used to practice and they were a part of, uh, they are a kind of, kind of Boidyo to the Koraput Raja of those times. And this guy has been invited by United States, some college or university, I don't know, but he had gone there to pre present his research paper and he does not know, he is not literate, he has not studied anything. But uh, he is curing some of the life-threatening disease on, on, based on the medication that his forefather has taught him. And the process is, is like that, ki he goes to a jungle, he sits before a tree, he, he does his sadhana, prathana, and that tree, tree reveals its secrets. And those secrets, he brings it in terms of leaves and all, and then he gives it to the patient. And we have example, whereby a kidney, kidney failed patient has got cured. And IIT Bhuvaneshwar, MKC Medical College, they are now run after him to understand the secrets of medication that he has. And nobody was able to convince him. Finally, uh, no, I could speak to him before five days and he has agreed to share the secrets of those life-threatening diseases where patient has lost hope. Maybe a cancer patient of stage for cancer patient. And there is an example we have because IIT Bhuvaneshwar professor is working with us. There is a kidney failure patient. So, so it's a it's an world yet to be explored. It is already there, we all know, this med medication system was there for thousands of years, but now it is coming to the realm of science. So, through this forum, I am of the opinion that 
do this kind of knowledge which is there in the system which is there in this nature needs to be brought to the for, uh, uh, forefront uh, through intellectual like you who would bring it to the world or the sufferings and the problems of millions of patient of various diseases could be cured and those patient or those people would be come out of the come out of the uh, exploitation of, of pharmaceutical company across the world because in a way you and i are used as a medium thank you jaydev now i request uh, dr c r anuparna to say her question good evening um, uh, in the education department from telangana and mostly concerned with tribal welfare of the uh, tribal welfare department and education so what i find two important problems faced by these tribal students firstly uh, they speak banjara language or gormati but they don't have a script of their own so they have to depend on one of the scripts the dominant scripts either telugu or english and they are expected to pass in this language as irrespective of the fact uh, not considering that none of their two languages is their mother tongue so they don't have script of their own language so it creates a problem like they are unable to give their knowledge to the society what their knowledge they have and at the same time they are unable to take what is present in outside the society into their society so uh, lack of script is becoming a barrier for these students so how to resolve this and this is also making them uh, in the trap they are trapped in that cultural system which they are they are unable to mingle with the rest of the society and that's a very interesting question to me there is a bit of um too much emphasis sometimes on script if you look at europe how many languages we have in europe at least 100 different european languages how many scripts we have we just have the latin script and then we have the greek script in greece and we have the russian cyrillic script in bulgaria ukraine serbia uh but we don't uh it doesn't matter uh, uh, well every tribe in india now thinks they want to establish their language by making a script no script is not the important thing it's the the language i mean i know it's a problem with say santali you write it in one way missionaries wrote it in the latin script then it's also written for some in bengali script then in orissa it might be written in uh and for example in shantiniketan where where to go made his university that is a santal area so there there is a bit of conflict should they be using um their own script or the bengali script for example and this can really get in the way of the importance of the language itself i mean you can use any script but the main thing is to use the language uh and this is what has been discouraged so sometimes for example when i was in jnu in jawaharlal nehru university and i saw some adivasi students there were really concerned with this developing the script for for santali or mundu language i i would try to say to them you know it's not the script that's important it's um the use of the language and uh since jdav is from assam i i went to the bodo area and within one day again with malvika we visited four different schools largely of the bodo people and we found in all of them they are using english or they are using hindi or bengali but um in one of the schools i i asked can any child sing a song in the bodo language and actually it was the headmistress's son who tried to he tried to sing but he they have never put it and in fact she told me later that they introduced uh um they cancelled the exams that day in the school and they just had a teachers meeting how can we bring the bodo language more into school that that those are the kind of initiatives that is needed for me the script is not important but you know i'm very open to you know many of these new tribal scripts are very useful too but i think it is also important that they adopt one script at least so that they can disseminate the knowledge this is true because i know they get lost in a conflict between two or three different scripts it's 
really uh, takes the energy away from everything. Uh, yes, I invite uh, Sagar uh, Kodi to Thank you. share his query. Sagar is a research scholar from Panducherry University. Yes, Sagar. Sir, uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, Sam. Um, am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, as I said, I am Sagar Kodi, research scholar at Panducherry University. Uh, I am working on the Chinchu tribe, uh, their livelihood, their education, and uh, traditional medical knowledge. Uh, I want to share my research uh, experience, which I had in uh, observed in the field work. Great. As, yeah, mostly this uh, Chinchu tribe, the children goes to ashram schools. After yeah. uh, from third class onwards, they will go to ashram schools. From third to twelfth class, and then uh, they goes to university or degree colleges. Uh, they staying in hostel. Ah, uh, there. As uh, ashram schools or indigenous schools, they are mainly meant for keeping away their children from their parents. Uh, because of this uh, separation from their parents and uh, separation from their traditional livelihood activities, they are not able to uh, uh, follow their traditions which their forefathers or parents were doing. Yeah. After finishing their uh, graduation education, they are not able to find any jobs for uh, either they are uh, coming to home or uh, they are finding any little job, small jobs. Because of this uh, ashram schools and uh, their education, uh, this education system is not providing any uh, jobs to them. And also, uh, it is not encouraging their uh, traditional livelihoods. Because I found that uh, because of this uh, education, uh, they are getting burden to their families because they are not earning earning money after getting uh, so much age and so. I I uh, what I say is uh, in the ashram schools they should at least teach their uh, traditional livelihood activities so that yeah 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 so that if they don't get any job outside at least they will get their uh, uh, income from the traditional activities. Thank you so much for that example. It's very typical experience, I think, of ashram schools. Yes, yes. That's what you have described so accurately. Yes. Uh. Yes, uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay, so now I request uh, Professor Gyan Gului and then Minti Pradhanji to share his query or Thank you. question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope I am audible because I do not know. Yes. Thank Perfect. you very much. Yeah. It was really very, very interesting, all the aspects of the brilliant exposition uh well as far uh, as regards my personal interest i am particularly interested in the question of language because i found for instance uh, many elements in the um, meditation of chitaranjan das about the way in which sanskrit is used has been used uh, to uh, discriminate to segregate parts of people from other parts of people, that is, to uh, um, to give up, so to speak, a class which is capable to speak Sanskrit, which is studying Sanskrit, from all those who are not studying Sanskrit and ignore Sanskrit. He polemizes, for instance, in a, in a, in a script um, also um, against the foundation of a, um, of a university which uh, in which uh, the Sanskrit language should be the only language, language spoken. This he points out many times how a language, in particular Sanskrit, but in, in a language can be used to discriminate between 
different levels of population and to and to, can be used to dis, to 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 segregate the parts of population from the cultural level, for instance, the cultural level. Uh, it seems to uh, give the sense of um, drawback of colonialism. That is, uh, he quotes, for instance, the way in which uh, Mac Macaulay spoke of English, of the function of English to have a, um, a, a class of Indian people who think uh, like uh, Englishmen, that is, who mediate between the English uh, colonialists and the colonialized people of India in order to progressively substitute the culture with the other culture, also so to speak, to impose also the English culture to India as the superior culture, that is, he has many times, Chitaranjan has many times this interest for the way in which a language can be used as an instrument of power and can be the mirror of the power of a class of the other classes. Uh, well, uh, there are of course in the history many examples in which uh, a language can be used to dominate. Uh, for instance, the way in which uh, the fascist regime in Italy has prohibited all, all the dialects, or the way in which the uh, regime of Franco in Spain has prohibited, forbidden the use of the language of Catalonia uh, and in order to impose the use of Castilian, or also the way in which in more recent times, the, um, so to speak, the pure form of modern Greek was used to uh, discriminate all those who spoke the, so to speak, the, the so-called popular form of modern Greek in order to create a subdetance, a submission of the, of the inferior parts of population to, the, to all those who were supporters of the regime of the colonels between 19, 1966 and 1973. And I think, well, well uh, what Chita Rajan does says about Sanskrit, about the use of English, about the colonialism and the post-colonialism, inheritance of the colonial attitude is very interesting and that the, um, the question of language really deserves much, much, much meditation, much, much analysis because it is a central point in how and, uh, the language itself can be used as an instrument of power and of submission of certain classes within the same country. It is, can be really a form of, of discrimination of of some, for some classes. And therefore, I thank you very much. Anyway, it was really all very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Gyan Gului. And now I invite uh, Miniti Pradhanji and then we'll offer a vote of thanks. But before Miniti ji, I request uh, Dr. Philip to share his reflection on the query by Maybe Dr. Maybe I... Gyan. I... I really appreciate what uh, one minute. Yeah, Maybe okay. before, before the vote of thanks, Minati may have our uh, question. Let us invite yes. her. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hope I'm audible. Uh, yes. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm actually deeply enriched by this discussion and especially Professor Felix. I mean, deep insight. Uh, when he was talking about cultural genocide, you know, I was just thinking it is not only with the indigenous people, but also with the non-indigenous people. We also feel, uh, you know, cultural genocide. When you reside outside your state, it becomes quite challenging to expose your child to, uh, you know, the culture of our own language and the culture of the residing state or um, country or whatever it uh, i mean uh, how this gap can be maintained this is one of my quiz and second thing is one of my observation i'm not very expert in this indigenous thing some of them some you know when they get formal education they themselves move away from their community they don't keep uh, keep any relation with their root and they come towards the mainstream and the gap widens you know 
that uh, how this thing can be maintained these are my two humble queries and thank you i have a uh, small query alex yeah. you referred to ecuador when uh, if you could tell a little bit about what kind of uh, you know practices of education that is happening in ecuador and uh, whether it also draws upon paulo freire and <coughs> as, as you were talking about paulo freire and our friend gian luigi also is a very great mm-hmm. lover of freire as many of us now how do we uh, you know kind of engage with freire now is there any for example freire was working in a particular setting you know mainly the working class and you know so if we bring a freer a model to the indigenous community what kind of transformation that the freer a model needs to undertake this is a really lovely question thank you ananta and i would emphasize again uh i think rajan and maybe shivanya has been there but maybe not any of the rest of you but this particular enterprise this particular initiative in bopal muskan has really applied paulo freire um and maybe also the associated school uh maybe a few hours outside bopal um called adarshila these two schools have really applied the concept in the sense of um rethinking what is relevant for the children so one thing is they get the children themselves to teach the teacher their language so it is not a one education is not a one way process and the more you know what can be more empowering for a child than to become a teacher of his teacher you know of of her teacher and this came to me particularly in about 5 years ago i was invited as a distinguished guest to a gathering of adivasi intellectuals and activists in bopal so they hadn't invited them but i invited my friends at muskan and they actually sent about uh half a dozen or 10 of their young teachers and then we had a subgroup on discussing tribal education so it was very interesting in that subgroup there were maybe about 30 people most of them st and it was started there were uh, some naga people so they were speaking to me in english and then the more experienced adivasis came and said nay um hum ko hindi mein baat cheet karenge so most of us speak hindi so we spoke in hindi but then when we were going around and everybody was introducing themselves most people were introducing themselves in hindi but the teachers from uh muskan no they introduced themselves in gondi or one of them in pardi the uh denotified tribal language and they did that almost with a humor almost challenging the adivasi elders who and it's at that moment it's like a shiver went down my spine because i felt here you were actually seeing young adivasis who are beginning to be school teachers and they are actually really proud of to speak their language and okay you may not understand gondi but you will understand a few words and then we can translate for you but why should we always make hindi or english or anything the hegemonic language um so that is within india they have really studied paulo freire and you know the political dynamic so they're really encouraging children to to talk and express if their if their father is getting drunk at night and abusing the the family or if the the police has demanded some corruption or or something they're encouraged to speak about that in school and that's the paulo freire method you you do not hide things under the carpet you allow children to speak in their language not saying you know that that not making them feel ashamed for for some culture cultural aspect or, or whatever is happening um and in ecuador i think they've taken this also i think as you say the influence of paulo freire is throughout latin america it started in brazil but um in ecuador in particular right from the 1920s 40s 60s uh they were starting to challenge the missionary model or the the kind of model of imposed colonial style education um 
So somehow it happened during the presidentship of Correa, who called himself a socialist. He was president for about eight years from 2000. In 2008, Ecuador made itself a new constitution under him where they recognized rights of nature and indigenous rights. So they defined Ecuador as a plurinational country. Now, this is a concept we don't have in, in India where, uh, you know, it's maybe in, in Canada also, they might refer to the tribes as nations. But in Ecuador, they very much do that. So uh, plurinational means not just one nationalism. It means really a plurinationalism where, um, and then when you bring this into education, you are really encouraging the people to bring their own cosmologies, their own ways of doing it. So they've started in Ecuador uh, an indigenous university that uses the concepts that come from Quechua and from the Amazon, because Ecuador has also very different tribals, like we have in India, the Adivasis and the Northeasterners. In Ecuador, too, you have the Quechua speaking Highlanders and the Amazonian who have very, very different culture, very different traditions, very different languages also. Um, so they managed to, the confederation that has been so strong in Ecuador is really linking these very different societies. And Quechua itself, it, uh, it was the language of the Incas, but the Incas were also a colonial power and they are said to have conquered Ecuador just 50 years before the Spanish. And in that process, they they carried out linguistic genocide. So some of the tribes in Ecuador, like Cañari, they have lost the language, but they speak Quechua if, or Spanish now. So Ecuador is a very interesting contrast to <coughs> India, but there is so much that can be learned from it. In this, what they, they call it there, the intercultural bilingual model of education. But bilingual because on the whole, in any area, they only have Spanish and Quechua. They, they're not, you know, in India, it would have to be multilingual. So I hope that clarifies a bit for you. Thank you. And uh, you have thought about Minoti's questions very quickly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, I think what she's saying is that it's like almost a generational gap that is there more and more in modern education. For example, children are being taught more and more through um, the medium of computers. This is something that Krishna Kumar, who I mentioned, Madhika's teacher, has very much questioned. Uh, because it means children, then they have no interest in what us old fogies know or did. It's like all in the present in the computer. That's my son Akash, he doesn't read books. He, he looks at the computer. It's a real challenge to me, that. But I wouldn't use the word cultural genocide for that. I think um, it's very specific for some of the tribal peoples who the languages are just um, disappearing. I mean, for example, the Deba Commission, it divided, it said it was making tech books, textbooks for the tribes that had more than 10,000 speakers. But that itself is a is a cut-off point. Like the Bodo tribe may have the whole population of Bodo may be only less than 10,000. So there are only 5,000 speakers by definition. With the Gondi and Santali, you have three to 5,000 speakers, three, three to five million speakers. But the decline, you know, how you measure now a speaker would be very difficult. In those times, yes, it was a, a, a challenge that they hadn't, they hadn't seen the importance of language in the way that several of us have speak, spoken about. And um, I think this this understanding is becoming more and more relevant. So the, the cultural genocide that the Adivasi people are facing now is, it, they lose everything. They lose any respect from the youth of their own society, let alone knowledge from other societies. They lose the land, they lose their language, the, so many aspects are being undermined by the education. For example, if, if you have a shamanic culture and then you're taught, well, that man is just a witch doctor, he's just superstitious, it's nonsense, then 
what disrespect you're teaching children for the the ancestors and the knowledge systems of the culture. Yes, that is very important, and this it is so inviting to kind of provisionally conclude with the issue of disrespect, the challenge of disrespect. Yes, and, exactly. And that is a profound challenge. And to understand the disrespect that our indigenous brothers are going through is also part of what can be called as world condition of disrespect. And here, for example, I remember the very important work of Axel Honneth from the critical theory tradition of Habermas, who has a book called Disrespect. So in a way, the challenge of disrespect today is one of the profound challenges before humanity, which is manifesting in many varieties of forms. But the way out from disrespect is multiple struggles and resistance and creativity yeah. from disrespect to respect yes. and what Honneth is saying is cultural models of cultural realization and, yeah. and also vibrates with Chitabhai because if the challenge is cultural racism and which you are uh, suggesting then the challenge is moving from cultural racism and disrespect to what can be called as practices of cultural recognition, co-recognition and co-realization. And, yeah. and that co-realization is uh, today is the challenge which requires, you know, the educating the educator in the sense that that how the non-indigenous today they like the kind of, this is uh, also very briefly linking to B.K. Roy Berman, another great anthropologist. And in a conversation, he was telling that today the Adivasis are the vanguard of the Mother Earth. Uh, in the sense that because all our resources are located in the territories of the Adivasis. And of course, uh, it is being taken away, but their struggle to preserve them is not only for themselves, but it is for that mother earth. So therefore that respect and then linking to Ecuador, that the respect of mother yeah. earth, right? Culture. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Thank you. Anna. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> now we invite Miniti ji to offer vote of thanks of today's uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Please open your video. You know. <laughs> At least in the vote up, thanks. <laughs> no, no, no. On, uh, yeah. Thank Anandabha, you. Actually, we should, have, uh, we should have the provision of opening of the video while discussing on this subject. Because when you switch off the video, we do not know who is listening and who is not listening. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, on behalf of Sadhya Chakra and Vishwanidam Center for Asian Blossoming, I, Vinati Pradhan, would like to thank today's our chief speaker, Professor Felix Pedal, for his deep insight, uh, full presentation regarding the subject. Thank you so much, sir. So much of gratitude from the heart. And I would also like to thank Professor Gan Luigi, Dr. Arnapurna, Madam Saranya, Mr. Rajan. Mr. Jaydev, Mr. Sagar Kodi, and uh, who all other present uh, remain present in our uh, today's discussion and enrich us with their opinions. I also would like to thank our Facebook um, users and uh, Facebook platform users and Zoom platform users for being with us and learning. Please pardon me if I have forgotten anybody's name. I thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.